This is my ultra long-term review of the 2020 M1 MacBook Air. Now I've had this machine for just about exactly two years. I placed the order in the last week of November and it got to my house two weeks later in the second week of December. So this has been my day in, day out daily driver. I've used it every day since I got it. And I can say with confidence that this is the best computer I have ever owned. Now I'm gonna try and get into as much detail as possible to qualify the statement. So I hope you come along, enjoy the journey. And I have my, note, my notes right here on my nice refurbished iPad Air 4. And if you want, I'm thinking of also doing a review video on this as well. So let's get into it. Now my history with Macs goes back to October of 2003 with the introduction of OS X Panther. And at the time I picked up an iBook G4 and the main draw to switching over to Mac was two things. First, it is based on the Unix operating system, meaning that the kernel is 100% rock solid. It doesn't crash or very rarely crashes. And second, I really love the introduction of Expose when they showed it off at Worldwide Developer Conference 20, 2003. So just the draw of not having as many crashes as Windows, in addition to the use of Expose, really drew me into buying a Mac. Now let's talk about the design and the aesthetic. Of course, the M1 Air comes in the iconic wedge shape, and it also utilizes a unibody construction technique. That means the entire case of the laptop is very stiff and robust, and it feels very well made. So if you open it up, first off, the display is not going to flex, and you can do a one finger open with your thumb of just opening up the laptop with one hand. Also, compared to PC laptops, you're not going to get any type of flexing of the display, nor are you going to get any type of flexing in the keyboard. So if you want a quality system, a quality build, you are definitely going to get that with the M1 Air. So all in all, through and through, from the keyboard to the palm rest to the trackpad, this is a very stiff, durable, and well-designed system. Let's talk about the display, keyboard, and trackpad. Starting off with the display, this panel is rated at 400 nits of brightness. That basically means that if you're using this computer indoors all of the time, you're not gonna have any trouble seeing the screen, nor are you gonna be lacking that much brightness. Now, if you take it outside in direct sunlight, or even if you take it out to a coffee shop, you may have issues seeing the things on the display. However, for my use case, I always keep this thing indoors. And because of that, I have no problem seeing the screen whatsoever. Talking about the keyboard now, this is a very nice backlit keyboard that utilizes the classic scissor switches. So of course, Apple went through a couple of years where they had the debacle concerning the butterfly switches, and that thing just died. It was destroying computers left and right because you can't type on the damn thing. Now, when it comes to this using scissor switches, I have not had a single trouble typing with this keyboard going back two years. So the scissor switch mechanism is tried and true. It is perfected. The feel and the uh, travel of the keys is great. I can type pretty fast on this keyboard. So when it comes down to really use, utilizing a laptop, two of the most important factors are the keyboard and of course the trackpad. Now the trackpad is phenomenal. It's got perfect tracking when you're using your mouse or your cursor. It can be very precise when you need it to be, but it also has a nice amount of acceleration to it so you can get your mouse to wherever you need it to go. It is also a force touch trackpad, which basically means that the, ta the, the pad itself does not depress or go down anywhere. It utilizes a haptic engine or a haptic motor embedded underneath the trackpad. And because of that, that's going to simulate the clicking of, of a real mouse. However, at the same time, the trackpad itself isn't going anywhere. And because of that, the haptic feedback is very pre precise. It does what you need it to do. And you can tell when you're actually clicking on the pad itself that that vibration motor is fine tuned to almost perfection. So you know, so you know when you are pressing on this trackpad. When it comes to audio, you're gonna be getting an average experience. This laptop cannot compare to the 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro. So I would lower your expectations when listening to audio on it. Um, you know, it does get loud, but there's no real bass definition. 
And um, yeah, it's just kind of lackluster. It's average, you'll get by their speakers, but comparing it to a 14 or 16 inch, you know, don't expect too much. Ports or lack of ports is probably the single biggest issue with this laptop. So the MacBook Air only comes with two USB-C ports. And if you wanna charge it up or keep it plugged into the wall, you're gonna be using one out of those two ports right off the bat. That means you're gonna be using the dongle life. So over here, I have access to USB-A, HDMI, another USB-A, and an SD card reader. Also, if you wanna include gigabit ethernet, you have to make sure that you get a dongle that supports hardwired ethernet. So these aren't too bad. This is a pretty small one that slips into my bag, but just be aware, if you want external connectivity, you're gonna be ending up getting the dongle. Now on top of that, in terms of HDMI and video display support, the MacBook Air only supports one external display at 4K resolution, 60 Hertz refresh rate. So if you have a really high-end monitor with a high refresh rate, this computer is not going to be able to support it. And when you hook it up externally, you're going to have just the internal built-in screen, and you're going to have a screen like me back there, my Dell UltraShark. So keep that in mind when it comes to buying a MacBook Air. If you like to use multiple monitors, and if you really need that screen real estate, this machine is probably not for you. When it comes to wireless connectivity, I haven't had any issues with the M1 MacBook Air. So there are reports that the Bluetooth on the Mac Mini, the M1, is kind of flaky. And same thing, I've seen some Wi-Fi issues pop up here and there with the M1 Mac Mini. But in my experience using the M1 Air, I haven't had a single dropout in Wi-Fi or Bluetooth using this computer. So I can say with confidence that there aren't really any type of things you have to worry about in terms of the wireless system inside of this computer. Specs and performance, let's get into it. Now, whenever I configure a system from Apple, I like to make sure it's gonna last at least five to seven years. So because of that, I upgraded this thing rather considerably. I took it from 256 gigabytes of storage up to a full terabyte, and I also doubled the RAM from eight to 16 gigs of RAM. So I maxed out the RAM in this computer. So this is a very robust machine that I'm confident is gonna last five to seven years. Now, when it comes to processor intensive stuff, all I use is iMovie and I'll use Hamburg to, tr to transcode Blu-rays. And it does both tasks very well. Now, what I think really helps my situation in terms of editing is having the 16 gigs of RAM because I've only been able to make this thing run out of RAM maybe three times in two years. So I am pretty careful, like when I have a lot of Chrome tabs going, I'll keep it in the background and I re won't really swap back and forth. So if I have a really intensive Chrome session, I'm not gonna be running Final Cut. If I'm editing, I say in iMovie, if I'm editing in iMovie, I'm gonna close down my web browser. So I'm very judicious when it comes to RAM management and because of that, I, I've only seen it hit the swap file like maybe three times. So having 16 gigs of RAM, I believe should be the minimum in 2022, if you really wanna get the most smooth experience possible. I also upgraded the SSD to a full terabyte. That's because I don't like editing off of uh, external drives. I like to have all my storage local in, inside of the laptop. So because of that, that's why I upgraded the storage. So when it comes to performance, this thing is a very good performer. Now, I am going to tell you that if you look at Handbrake in particular, when it comes to transcoding, you are going to get a much better experience if you're using the 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro. And the reason why is because it doubles the amount of performance scores. So theoretically, when I see Handbrake encodes, a Handbrake encode on the M1 MacBook Air is going to be about twice as long as doing an encoding on a 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip. So that's just something to keep in mind. If, if, if you use your laptop or your system as your bread and butter, if you're making money off of it, or if you're taking your hobbies very seriously, I would say skip the MacBook Air and go straight up to the, to the Pro. Now, when it comes to performance software, yes. So after about five or 10 minutes of use of intensive processor utilization, this machine will throttle the CPU because it is passively cooled, meaning there is no fan. And because of that, the chip is gonna throttle. However, when I use Handbrake, for instance, 
it doesn't really affect it that much. I may go from transcoding to yeah, 160 or 170 frames per second, and over time, that encoder is going to go down to about 140 frames per second. So even though you're running the CPU at a 100% tilt and handbrake, you're not going to be losing that much performance. And I also have to mention heat. This machine, it gets warm, it does get hot, but it's never super uncomfortable. And because of that, I'm going to talk about this compared to the M2 processor. Now, I have a lot of issues with the M2M. This is why I'm going to always recommend the M1 Air over the M2 Air. The reason why is because Apple says that they got an 18% increase in single, port, single core performance. But the way Apple got to that 18% increase is they had to increase the wattage going into the chip. And whenever you increase pro, uh, power going into a CPU, you are going to make it a hotter system. And the bad thing about the M2 MacBook Air is, yes, it is also fanless, but the cooling solution that they use in the M2 Air is not the greatest. Because of that, the M2 Air is going to throttle quite a bit, and it's also going to uh, be uncomfortable. It's going to get hot. Like, you don't want to put it on bare skin on your lap. So because of that, I'm telling, I've am telling i been telling all of my friends, do not get an M2 MacBook Air, right? Because it's a hotter chip. It is a faster chip by 18%. But as I said, whenever you increase water is going into a CPU, the damn thing's going to run hotter. The cooling solution in M2 Air, I don't believe is adequate. And you're just going to run into a lot of issues. Second, um, the, the storage gate. So we have the big storage issues coming along on the M2 MacBook Air. So as they say, if you get a 256 gigabyte SSD on the M2 MacBook Air, you're only talking about half the performance on SSD compared to the M1 Air. So the SSD in the M1 MacBook Air on this system, I get about 2.8 gigabytes per second on the read and maybe about 2.5 or 2.6 gig gigabytes on the write. So I'm going to pull up the pictures. I'm going to pull up my, my uh, speed scores, and you can see it on the screen. But the SSD is slower in the M2. Combined, if you use the base model and only get 8 gigabytes of RAM on the M2 base model, you're asking for trouble. The machine is going to throttle. The machine is not going to be able to video edit, at least in Final Cut Pro. So you're going to run into issues if you buy the base model M2 MacBook Air. If you buy the M1 base model MacBook Air, it's good. It's going to be, perform better than the more expensive M2 chip, the M2 Air. And that's why I have a lot of issues with that computer. And that's why I tell all of my friends, if they're looking for a Mac, if they're looking for something lightweight and portable, I'm guiding them to the M1 MacBook Air because it does perform, it is that good, and it is a stable platform. When you're buying a laptop, of course, you want to be able to take it away from the office, away from your desk. And you just want to go other places and work, maybe on an airplane, maybe in an airport terminal, things like that. So, of course, we're going to have to focus on battery life. Now, when you first get the M1 Air, the battery life is insane. Like, I was able to take it off of the charger for a full hour before the battery life would dip from 100% to 99% or 98%. So, out of the box, I believe the M1 MacBook Air is rated at about 18 hours of battery life. And you're really going to feel it when you first have the system. Now... One of the few disappointments I have with this is the battery life over two years. So on my computer, I have 168 cycles and 88% battery health. So that sounds pretty good, right? 88% battery health after two years. However, when I look at the actual use of my system, I've gone from about 18 hours of use down to maybe about nine or 10 hours. So when I do leave it unplugged from the wall, I can see the battery percentage dropping as I'm using this computer on battery. So I would say because of that, going from 18 hours down to about 9 or 10, yes, that is still phenomenal for a laptop this size. However, you got to consider that coming from 18 to 10 in two years is a little bit disconcerting. And because of that, I tend to leave this system plugged in all the time just because I don't want to have to worry about battery. Finally, let's talk about MagSafe and the camera. So one thing that the M2 Air has, which is MagSafe, is something that I'm really jealous of, 
USB-C, the problem with it is if you yank the cord, chances are you're going to take the computer with it. So MagSafe really was that, that nice peace of mind to have built into the computer, knowing that I wouldn't take my, my computer off the table if anything happened to it. So that's why I really like and miss MagSafe on the M1 Air. And finally, let's talk about the camera. The camera in the M1 Air is just trash. It's grainy. It's oversaturated. It's not oversaturated. It's grainy. It's not sharp. It's blurry. It's just a bad camera. So comparing the M2 Air with the 1080p webcam, that is a considerable difference. And that's something that I wish I had on the M1 Air is a 1080p camera. However, it isn't too bad with the advent of Ventura. You can use your iPhone's camera in place of the webcam on your on the M1 Air. So if you do upgrade to Ventura, that's a nice feature to have. It's really innovative. I like it a lot and it's convenient. So that's all I have to say about the M1 MacBook Air. The best computer I have ever owned. It's got the performance. It's got the, the thinness to it. It's not heavy at all. And I know that this system is going to last me at least five to seven years. If you pick one up, upgrade it just a little bit, at least get more RAM so you can like use it for more time. But aside from that, I'm really happy with this computer. I cannot recommend it enough. And I think if you pick one up, you're going to love it as well. All right, that's about it. Peace.